Good afternoon, all. The book I'm about to describe to you is one of the most disturbing and important books that I've reviewed to date. I'm going to try and keep this short, and I would ask people to share. Um, we don't have a great deal of literature about Antifa. There's not much out there that tells us exactly who this is, what they're doing and how powerful they actually are. And a part of their power, of course, is stemmed from a rather despicable mainstream media, uh, but you won't be surprised to hear me say that. The media drifts between painting Antifa as a the good guys and denying they exist at all. Uh, sometimes this happens even simultaneously. But they do exist, it does exist. And the book that I'm going to read some from for you now is called Unmasked, Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. The uh, Recommendation on the front of the book is simply read this book, and that's by Tucker Carlson. The author is Andy No. Uh, he has been incredibly brave to take this on, and Antifa have done what Antifa does, which is threaten and riot and cause trouble trying to intimidate shops out of stocking this book. Um, for that reason alone, I want to urge people to read it uh, because Antifa don't want you to, but because it is an extraordinary account of just how violent, extreme and steeped, steeped in hatred, these people really are. But even more alarming than that is the support they have from mainstream politicians. Uh, mainstream politicians who are either too weak to find out who Antifa actually are, or they are so unprincipled that they're willing to support them simply because of the media, they, they're afraid of negative media coverage if they don't we see what the, we see what the media does <clears throat> to politicians who don't toe the line we see what they did to Donald Trump for example so politicians are a mixture of a mixture of those two things too uninformed to understand this or too spineless to tell the truth about it and too spineless to stand up to the media so Antifa is not without power so I've got I've picked out a few uh, sections that I want to read to you. It I'm going to start on the you remember the autonomous zone that uh, was set up by left wing extremists in uh, Seattle, and uh they ironically um and, and rather deliciously put a border around it these people are anti-border um but the first thing they did when they set up their little autonomous zone in seattle was put a border around it they are anti-police uh and yet they they want to defund the police and yet they uh phoned the police on numerous occasions from inside this little area they'd set up. Um, these people are ridiculous, in other words, genuinely ridiculous. Okay, let me read a little bit about this. So this is from the, uh, which which Andy um, spent time in and sort of infiltrated, it's probably the wrong word, um, but they know him, uh, so he, he snuck in uh, a great risk to himself. He has been physically um, assaulted by them, uh, intimidated by them on numerous occasions. There's a photograph in here of uh, Antifa outside his house wearing masks 
of his face. Um, and, and, and standing, it was sort of making a circle around his head. They really are incredible, incredible people and, and incredibly dangerous. Okay, I'll start this. Uh, on June 8, 2020, staff and officers of the Seattle Police Department, SPD, frantically loaded what they could from their East Precinct onto cars and rented a moving and, re and a rented moving truck. The East Precinct is located at the heart of Capitol Hill neighborhood in Seattle, a densely packed business and residential area popular with artists, leftists and the city's LGBTQ community. For days, the neighborhood was marred by scenes of intense violence by rioters intent on overtaking the East Precinct, similar to what was done to the third precinct in Minneapolis. Night after night, hundreds of Antifa and Black Lives Matter militants lined the streets, throwing rocks, concrete chunks and incendiary devices at officers, leading to multiple injuries. By now, police were banned from using tear gas to disperse the rioters. This is where the politicians come in. It's incredible. The, poli the politicians would not allow the police to do their jobs. A few days prior, Police Chief Carmen Best relented to political pressure from the mayor's office to ban the police department from using the crowd control tool despite its effectiveness. Mayor Jenny Durkin, a Democrat and former US attorney in Washington state, appointed by Barack Obama, had given numerous concessions to the far left in the wake of George Floyd's Death. A week and a half prior, on May 30th, 2020, multiple Seattle Police Department cruisers were smashed and set on fire by rioters dressed in black block. In the chaos, some of the rioters stole weapons, including AR-15s, from the vehicles. There were no police in sight. Harrowing footage recorded at the scene showed a security guard for a local Fox News affiliate charging with his handgun to disarm one of the militants who stole a rifle. The unnamed Marine Corps veteran did this twice, successfully taking back stolen rifles from two black bloc militants. Despite the ultra-violence of the Seattle riots, police were prohibited from using the best tool they had for crowd control, CS gas. Also known as tear gas, CS gas is used by law enforcement agencies around the world. As soon as one is exposed to the gas, which is dispersed from canisters, the eyes, nose, throat and skin experience intense irritation. Through the course of my protests and riot reporting, I have described it. I have been exposed to it at various times and intensities. I describe the feeling as walking into a plume of pepper. He goes on in this chapter to describe in great detail uh, life inside this autonomous zone, the violence used by Antifa and Black Lives Matter, and they are interchangeable as, to, as, as far as personnel is concerned, largely the same people. Um, that turn up to each other's protests and, and, and are heavily involved in, in each other's groups. Um, but I haven't scratched the surface here of the violence in Seattle and Portland, which are the sort of hubs of Antifa, particularly on the Pacific coast of uh, the United States. Um, he also goes into a lot more detail of the concessions by politicians to Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And they're crippling of the police and their sort of reining in of police and being in any way effective in tackling this violence. So the overall picture is that you've got Antifa and Black Lives Matter committing extreme violence against property and against people, uh, calling for extreme political extreme policy um, that would dismantle civilized society in the United States. And the response to this is the police wanting to do their job and rein in and prevent chaos, violent chaos in the streets, but the politicians not allowing them to. So you end up with absolute lawlessness on the streets of, of US, major US cities. It's the press won't report on this. It doesn't report on this. I'll get on to the press uh, in a couple of minutes. But it's the perfect storm. And I think I mentioned on my, my live stream uh, when I spoke about this last week that Andy himself has said, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago whether I thought the US would fall, I would have laughed and thought this is, you know, don't be ridiculous. We're talking about the United States here. Now, he's not so sure. 
uh, because the politicians are on the side of the anarchists and they are not allowing the police to do their job and prevent violent disorder in the streets and the press are not reporting on the violent disorder in the streets. That's a serious, serious matter. In fact, when, when uh, Donald Trump attempted to describe this as domestic terrorism, which is what it is, he was attacked by the press. And that's, I guess, an understatement. Okay, I want to move on to... Um, the, uh, some, I guess the ideology behind this and the and Black Lives Matter. So in a chapter entitled Black Lives Matter, he writes, <clears throat> After Donald Trump was sworn into office, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Coulors was interviewed in the Los Angeles Times. In August 2017, she asked if BLM would be open to a conversation with... She was asked if BLM would be open to a conversation with the president. She responded, we wouldn't, as a movement, take a seat at the table with Trump because we wouldn't have done that with Hitler. Hit Trump is literally the epitome of evil. All the evils of this country, be it racism, capitalism, sexism, homophobia... In her own words, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter demonstrates how closely the organization's ideology aligns with Antifa. Central to both is the goal of abolishing law enforcement, American jurisprudence, national borders and free markets in the name of anti-racism and anti-fascism. BLM also seeks to undermine free speech. In October 2017, students affiliated with BLM at the College of William and Mary in, Mer in Virginia prevented the executive director of the Virginia tra chapter of the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union, from speaking, live streaming the shutdown on a student BLM page. Students shouted, the revolution will not uphold the Constitution and liberalism is white supremacy. They were angry at the ACLU that the ACLU had given a principled First Amendment defence of far-right ideologues. Earlier that year, Coulors had was interviewed by Katie Tour on MSNBC, where she stated, hate speech, which is what we're seeing come out of white nationalist groups, is not protected under First Amendment rights. Um, she's legally wrong on that for a start. Um, that has been, that, an answer and that has been asked of the US Supreme Court who responded that yes indeed so-called hate speech defined by whom that's another matter that so-called hate speech is indeed protected by the first amendment it goes on under a, a, a heading of foundation of lies this part there's a lot of detail in this section and this is one of the this is so significant and so important i've said before that the black lives matter riots all over the world were based upon a lie and they were Foundation of Lies. On August 9th, 2014, an 18-year-old black male named Michael Brown committed a strong-arm robbery at a neighbourhood convenience store in Ferguson, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Shortly after, police officer Darren Wilson, who is white, questioned Brown. Brown matched the description of the robbery suspect reported to police. According to Wilson, Brown assaulted him during the questioning and attempted to grab his pistol, causing it to fire inside the car. Wilson says he chased after Brown, who turned around and charged at him. Wilson fired upon the six foot four man who died at the scene. The killing of Brown set off days of rioting and looting in Ferguson, as well as other protests across the United States. With the aid of social media and wall-to-wall -wall broadcast coverage featuring rumours that Brown had surrendered with his hands up and was executed, the BLM narrative was born. From coast to coast, hands up, don't shoot became the mantra that drove tens of thousands into the street to protest or riot against what they say is institutional racism in policing and in the American justice system. Going on, BLM is usually presented as an anti-racist uprising uprising and movement focused on countering anti-black police brutality and quote-unquote systemic racism. This effective branding strategy in the name has masked BLM's true radical ideology. 
Carol Swain, a retired political scientist who is black, is a scholar of American politics and law. She has spoken critically about BLM and its laundering of radical Marxist ideas into the mainstream. For how for her outspokenness, she was protested by students and subjected to demands that she be fired. Since its founding, BLM leaders have not hidden its radical Marxist orientation. BLM draws from the legacy of the militant black power movement of 1960s and 70s, seen in figures it reveres. It reveres like convicted cop killer and fugitive Asata Shakur. There are several uh, stories in this chapter of the lies, 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 lies that bring people out uh, onto the streets to protest about apparent uh, anti-black violence from US police forces. And the detail uh, behind these is, is simply not what it's presented to us as. Um, we There are examples in here, really, really terrifying uh, stories as well, where hardened criminals, violent people with criminal, violent criminal record, records as long as your arm, getting a visit, for example, by Kamala Harris, while police officers who are doing their job, the details of these, case, these instances are correct, these police are doing their job, and being charged with first degree murder, uh, which in some states can, can result in the death penalty, while the hardened criminals they shot. I, 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 and and in, again, if these, if, these, uh, if these descriptions are accurate, and they are doing their job in accordance with the law, these police officers, shooting in their, in their own defense, violent criminals, uh, they are getting charged with first degree murder which, as I say, in some states can carry the death penalty and in others, and if it doesn't carry the death penalty, you're talking life without parole. Um, while the hardened criminal with the record as long as your arm is honoured as a, as a hero. And even in one instance got a visit, as I say, from Kamala Harris, who told uh, one of these criminals that she was, quote, proud of him. Meanwhile, the poor policeman is... Uh, is uh, Facing life in prison, or worse. Actually, I think I'd. Uh, I think I don't think there is much worse than life in prison. But that's. Uh, okay, final part of this. This is about the news, and one of the most alarming parts of this entire thing. So we've got politicians preventing the police doing their job. We've got a clever disguise of ideology in terms of getting people onto the streets by by pretending that there is some that that black people can't uh, walk the streets of America without being shot by the police for no reason um then you've got the this this disguise is getting people out thinking they are uh, opposing racism when actually what they're doing is promoting an extreme, extreme political agenda. If all of that's not bad enough, you have a poisonous, toxic mainstream press at the back of it. And that's what I'm going to read out a little bit about last. So if you're an average apolitical American, these and similar headlines are probably what you've skimmed about Antifa at some point since 2017. So here are the headlines. Anti-fascists will fight Trump's fascism in the streets. Hurricane Harvey. Antifa are on the ground in Texas helping flooding relief efforts. Reminder, if you're not Antifa, you're pro-fa. Another one. Anti-fascists linked to zero murders in the US in 25 years. Who caused the violence at protests? It wasn't Antifa. All of those are all headlines in the US press. This, Andy goes on to say, this is just a small sample of headlines from Antifa related stories that ran in the media from The Guardian to The Washington Post since 2016. If one isn't tuned into the nuances of the American political and culture war, for example, people like my own parents, the default position is to view Antifa as the good guys. With the obligations of family life and work, few have time to actually investigate beyond the headlines and leading paragraphs. The role of the media is to inform the public, but too often when it comes to Antifa, we are fed incorrect information. 
I don't believe most liberal journalists set out to intentionally mislead their audiences and readers about Antifa. I think it is pure ignorance that leads news personalities like MSNBC's Joy Reid or CNN's Chris, Chris Cuomo to repeat some variation that Antifa is just short for anti-fascist. But something different that I observed in my years of reporting on Antifa is the existence of whole networks of writers and so-called journalists who intentionally spread pro-Antifa messaging. Their stories go beyond mere bias and into the realm of propaganda. Most do it as ideological fellow travellers of the far left, but some I've learned are actually members of the militant Antifa movement. He goes on to talk about unpersoning and how the media will join in with Antifa in the demonization of Antifa's opponents. So if you want to, if you want to stand up and, and uh, protest against Antifa, or you are a target of Antifa, like me, for example, uh, you will also become a, a target of the press. The press and Antifa working alongside each other to hide and disguise their true belief systems, um, to sanitise what they are actually calling for, but also to attack anyone that they, they deem, that Antifa deem to be problematic. Uh, in other words, anyone who isn't firmly in their camp is considered a fascist by them. Interesting final point what I want to talk about in this book is really, really interesting that he talks about the transformation of language. Uh, and I've talked about this before as well. And the media is also a fellow traveller in this regard. Uh, words no longer have meanings. You are what Antifa say you are, whether you actually... Well, let's take the word fascist. The word fascist has a definition. It's, a, it's not a firm definition, but it has characteristics. Um, and we can debate, we can debate uh, 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 you know, fascism itself. And we can, I, I agree that it doesn't have a firm definition, like microphone. We know what a microphone is. Fascism isn't quite as clear cut as microphone. Um, but it does have characteristics. And characteristics that are fundamentally, we must agree, are characteristics of fascism. Um, so I agree, you know, that it's not entirely rigidly decided, um, the, a clear definition of fascism. It is a, an interesting word that can be debated. Um, but it, it does have characteristics. And, and if you are going to label someone a, a fascist, then they must at least have some of the characteristics that we associate with the word fascist. Um, but it, that's not the case. You are a fascist if Antifa calls you a fascist. And this is part of the, um, whether or not you fit, you have characteristics that fit the characteristics of fascism, you are what they say you are. And the press will go along with that. There's no, you know, they will call me a, a racist or far right without ever offering definition of racist or far right and then giving evidence that I fit either of those two terms. You are what they call you, regardless of whether you fit the description or not. Now, this means that language is whatever the far left decides it is. And interestingly, um, there are a lot of... I, I, I make no conclusion from this, but an awful, an awful lot of, of trans, extreme trans activists involved um, in these organisations as well. And he does mention um, the demolition of biological sex as part of the demolition of objective language. The demolition of objectivity itself allows for Antifa to call you whatever they want to call you without having to justify that name. So they're getting rid of objective reality itself. And as part of that, or at least a, a sample or example of that, is the destruction of biological sex and, and, and the reality of biological sex. So, this is an incredible book. Um, I, I knew Andy um, back when I was on Twitter. Um, he's a really good guy and I'm very, very fond of him. And but that's one reason I would ask you to support him. He's very, very brave and he's very, very principled. Um, but another is that this is a remarkable book. It will shock you. I read it in two short sittings. I, I just, I devoured it. It will shock you. It's brilliantly um, written. It's succinct. It's just over 300 pages. Um, but it is one of the very few 
it may be the only, in fact, a detailed description and um, alarm. It's an alarm. It, it, it's a wake-up call of who Antifa are, what they're doing, and the fact, the most alarming part of it all, is that they have mainstream US politicians on both sides, Republican and Democrat, of course, overwhelmingly Democrat, on their side, and those politicians are not allowing the police to deal with the disorder and the criminal behaviour of Antifa. That's a very dangerous situation. Unmasked, inside, sorry, let me get the title, let me get the full title. Unmasked, inside Antifa's radical plan to destroy democracy. It's probably the most recommended book that I've done so far. Read it. Okay, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the weekend.